Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Appreciate the full room. Wow, that's awesome. Uh, it's great. Great seeing everyone. Uh, people sometimes only see a conference and stuff. It's awesome. So thanks for coming. Thanks for coming for the presentation. So we are going to be doing presenting on practical componentization, improving Drupal development and site building. So basically what we are using is Pattern Lab and the, some other tools to automate and to make a front end a bit better than what Drupal outputs. As you guys know, Drupal is not very good at putting the front end as we are good creating the back end. And even Doris actually agreed to that, that Drupal made our way sure to work on the back end and have a solid back end. And now Drupal 8, we are working more on the front end. So this is stuff that we kind of are finding to help make things better. So this is what this presentation will be about it. So uh, we are going to be doing a talk. I'm going to go through quick step by step of all this stuff that we are doing. Then Homer is going to do a live demo. Fingers crossed. <laughs> because nothing can go wrong with that, a live demo, right? Of course. Uh, and then we'll have uh, questions and QA. Okay, so if you guys have questions and stuff, write down, and then at the end we will be answering other questions and all this stuff. It's quite a bit to absorb and everything, but hopefully the goal of this is at the very end, you guys will be able to go home and then install this stuff and get to work on the Drupal 8 site. Okay? So, my name is Pierre Marcel. I am a Drupal front-end architect, that's what I like to call myself. Uh, I've been working with Drupal for a long time. I started with uh, 4.6 back in 2006. And uh, here I am still, and I love it. Uh, you can find me at Drupal.org. I love helping people. I am one of the organizers for Drupal TO. So if you guys have any questions about that, please ask me. Uh, and recently, I'm a, I'm a freelance developer, and recently I joined Therefore in January, and uh, Alex was crazy enough to let me do this stuff, and then he was crazy enough to give me this guy, which is freaking awesome JavaScript dude. And then we brought what I was doing to the next level, so I'm very happy to have joined Therefore and do this stuff. So my name is Sean Homer. I go by Homer because we have two Seans, so it's easier to remember. Uh, it's much cooler too. <laughs> and it's much cooler. You get used to it. Uh, I've been a developer for over 10 years. Um, I'm a senior developer at Therefore, and you know, some of the background in Node.js and JavaScript as well. So Drupal is still newer for me, but you know, at Therefore we've been given a chance to start looking at technologies like this and ways to improve things so that we're not, you know, doing the same things over, reinventing the wheel, and finding ways to improve things. And we had the latitude of there for, and it's been a very good situation. So. So. OK, so let's start with some basic scene here. So what is a component? So I assume that pretty much everyone knows what a component is. So it's been around for a little while already. So basically, a component is extracting a piece of uh, data or content from a website and identifying that and the basic encapsulating this. That's what a component is. Uh, so to better try to find the definition for it, I went to Wikipedia and then I did a search and that's what it says. So, and of course, depends for the industry that you are. One thing that I liked was this part here, encapsulate a set of related functions or data. And you know what, for us web developers, that is exactly the meaning of a, a component. So when you're thinking about a component, that's what it is. A component can be a large piece of uh, related functions or a very small one. And we will see uh, how that works. So basically we have in here a few different components, okay? So here is a very simple uh, call to action three app component. Uh, as you can see in here. So we have a title, we have subtitles, and then we have a little blurb, and then a button. In here, 
is another component. As you can see, we have some SVG images. We have uh, uh, this here. This can be also extracted on this way. So this would be one component. This one is a group of components, okay? And you will understand why pretty soon as we start explaining. Here's another one, a social media component, right? And here is a very easy, simple uh, footer menu, for example, that's a component. If we have a mega menu, that would be a component as well. Uh, so that's what a component is. So now the question is, why componentize, you may ask. So, and the answer is right here. So, how many in here are you guys uh, from end developers? Because, okay. So, you guys know that if we remove the CSS from this, it's all the same thing. And here's the thing. Backend developers, you guys write once and reuse. That's why we have modules in Drupal.org. Front-end developers, we reinvent the wheel every time we try to do something. And I'll, I'll explain why. Over there, we have title, blurb, button, background image. Title, blurb, button, background image. Title, blurb, button, background. Background image, title, button. So why we keep reinventing this HTML markup every single time? Uh, because that's what we front end people do. And we try to reinvent the wheel every single time. So the reason why why it's componentized is because I'm tired of freaking writing this. I want to have it ready for me, finish, and go drink beer. Because that's what we do, right? <laughs> so. When I start working with it, so I start working on, uh, on a few different ways of uh, how to achieve that, and I came across this thing called Atomic Design. So have you guys heard about Atomic Design? Yeah? So it's an awesome guy. So what is Atomic Design? Atomic Design is a methodology on how to organize components in a clean, in a clean and methodical way. And it can be for anything. So it, it, it's not only websites. So for example, I use Atomic Design for building my IKEA furniture. So I have a 10-year-old daughter, and her job is when we buy a IKEA furniture, we open the package, and then we separate every single little screw, and then we put on the floor, just like this. And then we start building. By the end, we know how many pieces we have of each, and it's much easier to build that IKEA furniture because now I know what's being used, the size of the screws side by side, and everything. So it works for anything. It works for a tangible life thing like we're doing, and it works also for a website. So let's give an example in there. So everything's messed up. Definitely you can build something in there. You know, we all will be able to build something if we were giving this. But if we organize in a way, now our brains start identifying and we are able to start having ideas to build different things with the same thing that we have. And also at the end, we will know how many things we had and what we can build. So that's what atomic design is. It's nothing more than a starter point of a methodology that you can start and adapt. So do I follow atomic design exactly like Brad Frost uh, wrote? Mm, probably not. I read his book twice, and I follow the guy, and I love what he's done, but I did change a little bit for the things that I do. So here's the dude who created, very smart guy, and uh, he was tired as well of uh, this chaos in design, so he came up with it. I like to give him uh, uh, you know, point and uh, that's who that is. So, how does atomic design work? So basically, Brad's idea was he had to find a way to organize. If you're gonna organize something, you have to name. How you name? You know, for you guys from end developers, you guys know that naming a component or something is as hard as naming your kid. 
Because as soon as you start naming, it's like, oh my God, does it make sense? You know, the next person is going to come down. Is that going to make sense? Am I going to look stupid for calling this this? Right? So I was creating a, a button a couple of days ago. And it's the mobile toggle. And then I called... Uh, uh, what did menu I call? hamburger. Menu burger. <laughs> menu burger. Because it was really funny. And then I pushed to our repo just so Homer could see. And Homer's like, dude, I think menu burger is a bit weird. I think toggle is better. It's like, ah, dude, I love burger. But anyway, so that a little joke. So what he did is he went back to his high school times. And then he went to chemistry and machine. So you guys know the atom is a very small little thing. It's an atom. A molecule is a group of atoms, but limited to a group of atoms. So about maybe one, two, two, look, three atoms. Then organism. Organism is a group of atoms and molecules, or molecules. And then he ran out of analogy on his chemistry. He decided to name template and pages. Right? It happens. So, and here's what it comes. Do I follow him exactly what he's doing? No, because in Drupal, templates and pages is kind of, uh, we have already that name in space. We use templates for something else. So we decide to change and we rename uh, mockups and the layout. So we switch this from to layout and this to mockups. And as I go, you'll see why. So that's how it works. Atoms, molecules, organisms. So you hear how it works. It's pretty cool. So you have an atom. An atom will be like each of those. Now becomes a molecule. Now becomes an organism. Now becomes a template. And now becomes page. So that's how atomic design works. So now, here's the thing. Let's go back a few screens back and then think about the, the little tractor that they were building, the little car and all that stuff. Imagine buttons. Now we have a list of buttons throughout the whole site that we know it's in there. We have a list of titles. You know, for you for, and developers and for you guys build sites, you guys know a lot of designers come and say, Pierre, that font is not 22. And it's like, it is, I code it in the back. Like, no, 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 it's not 22. If we have this a living style guide, it's like, yes, it's right here and you can see. So that's what it is. So it's really good for displaying and that kind of a building this thing. So that's how atomic design works. So now let me get to my water here. So a lot of people, they confuse Pattern Lab with Atomic Design. And it's two different things. So, Atomic Design is a methodology to organize components. Pattern Lab, it's nothing more than a living style guide. And the reason why people confuse is because Brad Frost created Pattern Lab, uh, sorry, Atomic Design, and then he knew this guy called Dave Olson which is a programmer, and he said, hey, I love this stuff you're doing with, that, with Atomic Design. You need something to, host all, to, ho to, to house all this stuff. How about we write a living style guide for it? And he said, let's do it. So when they built, they built using Atomic Design. But Panel Lab is nothing more than a living style guide. And what is a living style guide? Living style guide is a set of tools for managing, testing, documenting, UI, and organizing in the visual way and outputs static HTML pages that goes into a folder which you can push into your server and now your designers, your clients, your co-colleagues, your boss, everyone can see the work you're doing all on an organized way which we'll show. So Pattern Lab runs on PHP and Node but you don't need that to see the page because like I said once PHP and Node does what it has to do, it creates a static HTML file and put it in there. So Pattern Lab have a few additions, that's what they call. So 
It's all running in PHP. And we have mustache, we have twig, we have Drupal. Drupal is broken in Panel Lab because they're not maintaining. So there is a, a, a little fork that is happening now. Uh, so just be aware if you get the, the one from here. I think I have a link later on. And then they have Thin. Thin has nothing. It's Panel Lab engine and you come up with whatever you want to use as a template. It's up to you. So, use your own methodology. So, Big Olson wrote this for Brad Frost, and now they have a new maintainer as well by Brian. So, this is what a panel lab is. So, it's nothing more than a living style guide. So, here's an example of, uh, of the page. Uh, so, here is actually the same, the, the page, is the mock-up, what we are calling now. So, this is all loaded from Panel Lab with uh, uh, data modeling coming from a YAML file. Okay, so Panel Lab in Atomic Design. Every time when we are giving a component or a task to build something, okay, we look at this as a front end developers and we say, that's pretty simple, it's a testimonial here. A, we can wrap this into a div, another div, another div, another div. So for divs, one wrapping the whole thing, boom, we have our markup, right? Yes, but now if we start thinking about Drupal, what does Drupal do? <laughs> this is what a Drupal does. I actually built this, so kind of embarrassing, but back in the days. So, <laughs> Anyways, look at this. This is what we call Diviitas, right? So it just go this craziness thing going down. No, let's throw your testimonial somewhere in here. And all this stuff around and everything, and it's just crazy. It's just crazy. Like, I, 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 it's just insane. And that's why Drupal got a bad, bad rap, because of this stuff in here that we used to do. <laughs> Uh, so, so that's what we are trying to solve. So now let's go back. Let's go back to our component. Forget Drupal for a while. Let's go back to our panel lab and our uh, atomic design. Okay, so to run panel lab, to run a component into panel lab, all you need two files, the .twig file and the YAML file. That's it. Once you create that, you can write your mockup and then your demo data goes in here in your YAML file, and that's it. So now, let's say a client is not too sure or the testimony is not fully approved. They say that the, this part in here won't be the name of the person, it will be the C. So if we would do that in Drupal, we would create a field, we would name the field after what it is, now they told us to change it to a city. Well, now I need to do location. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna have to go delete that field in Drupal, create a new one, and add that data. And then you know how long that takes, right? So, in here, this is a sample of uh, our .twig file. So, going back, when we are assigned a task, we wanted to do this as uh, 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 simple as simple as can. And uh, you can write in many ways. Actually, still using spam, it's supposed to be divs in here. But, uh, uh, so you can write super clean, and that's how it works. So using Panel Lab, what you do is you create uh, variables that makes more sense. Okay? And then you'll see how we're going to tie all this whole thing. So you create a div, 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 put your uh, 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 variables and everything in there, and everything is pretty. So then you create your YAML file, and as you can see, it goes. So it just works just like an array in Drupal. So we have testimonial, author, name. Testimonial, author, name. And this is how we organized. You can do name, author, position, company, one below another. So nothing stopping you from doing that. 
So now I'll ask you, what is faster and easier when the client changed their mind because you're building on the fly? To change a static YAML file or to change the Drupal field in the database? Definitely this one, right? So that's where the power is and that's where we are gaining speed, okay? So prototyping, super easy. You just create this. Reusability, because we are working a component, now Alex say, hey, you know that, that testimonial thing you made there? Can we put in this other site? Sure. Drop, done. So once you create that, this is what a pattern lab living style guide page will look like. It's pretty cool. And this is created on the fly for you. It shows you the twig file, it shows you the HTML markup rendered with the data, and then show your component is styled. So it's super cool. So now we want the designer to sign off for the president to sign off on something and then we send this and it said looks good. Merge that to our master database. And so we do. Okay, so you gotta say, okay, cool. Here Homer, how the heck we tie this into Drupal? Well, that's a good question. There are a few things we need to do before we get there. There is one piece of a, of a of thing that we need that's required, which is a, a module called Components Library. It was uh, created, was built by uh, John Alban. You guys all know him. And uh, he wrote this module. It's a very simple module. All it does, it allows Drupal to load a non .html .twig file into Drupal because you know if you don't have a .html .twig you won't load and as you notice all my twig files were actually twig files I don't know why in Drupal we do that it's like everything we grab we want to change it's like why don't you use .twig file for some reason I never went to look for it but they did so he wrote this module that now allows us to render a .twig file and also outside of the template folder. So that's pretty cool. So things that will make your, easy, your life easier. Even if you're not doing anything, uh, lab or anything this year, it's three awesome thing. So twig, 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 field value, and program. So this module in here grabs the data, you know in Drupal, because in Drupal you have your field, the field is wrapped into a field template, the field template is wrapped into a region, and then it goes into your page sometimes, right? So when you load that variable, that field, into your template, it's loading everything. And now if we go back a few slides before, I don't want that DVI that's in my thing. I wanted to have my data. I gave my data to you, Drupal, give me back, and I don't want your DVI that's thing. So this year we will put the content, the data, from that field, it's pretty cool. Twig Twig is really awesome. I'm not gonna go through, but you guys, uh, this presentation will be available on the page. You guys click, download, use in your Drupal 8. It's awesome. In Paragraph, how many people in here have you used in no Paragraph? Pretty much everyone? Okay, awesome. So, Paragraph 1. So when a building component way, we could create our component, we could create our field, and put it straight into the content type. But we wanted to reuse, and also, nowadays, every single website we build, it's kind of a this stackable sort of a website, right? So because of that, we decided to use Paragraph. So Paragraph, I don't know if I should spend much time explaining exactly what it is, but Paragraph is a Drupal entity, right? So we have blocks, blocks is an entity, content type is an entity, so paragraph is an entity that you enter, you create fields, enter data, but you have to use another entity in order to display. It's not self, you can't display self or anything. But as you can see, we can create our fields, we can name and we can do everything what we want. There's the manage form of display, there is the manage display, it goes out like that. So just like a, a content type that we have. So once you create your, your uh, paragraph, 
you have to inject inside a uh, content type. Or you can inject inside a block type because it's an entity and it's fillable. Or you can inject inside your taxonomy term because that also is fillable entity. So we use this field called entity reference revision. Okay? So we create that. And remember, we used to build on our content type. We have title, we have body, we have button, link, blah, 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 blah. Now we have this one here. And you can add multiple reference fields and stuff. So, but we're not going to get there. So once you added that field, it gives you this option to choose which content, which paragraph type you wanted to add into your, into that list. Because sometimes you're building a landing page or you're building a news page and you don't want to give the whole kitchen sink to the editors. You want to just give what is more specific for that particular content type or page. So you can check, 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 and that's how it's going to be loading in there. So it's, it's pretty cool. Okay, so now to tie this into Drupal, right? So now we have our component, we have, it's all styled, it's all in there in, in, in Panel Lab. Uh, now we created our entity, our paragraph, we inject our paragraph inside our content type because that's how we want it to display. Now we need to connect this two. So, and now that's how it works. So every paragraph or any entity that we create in Drupal, you guys know that we get a namespace for a uh, file. So with this file, what we are doing, we are doing this include, okay? So you can do this include with anything in Drupal 8 in the end of going from one template to the other. Now we are pointing to the .twig file that we created early on for our testimonial inside the molecule, and that's how it works. So now this part in here looks a bit complicated, but remember the YAML file that I displayed? Exactly the same structure. Check it out. Testimonial, style. This is simple because it's the way that we style our thing, so it goes as a, as a data dash. Then we have quote, which now we are mapping field to variable, field to Variable to field, variable to field. So this is Drupal, this is Panel Lab. Okay? So that's how it works. And then the field underscore value is the field, uh, twig. Fi the twig, twig value. Twig value. The field twig value. That's what uh, this is. So what I'm saying is grab me this field, display my data without DBIDAS and then put inside that beautiful markup that I just wrote. And that's what it's doing. So basically you map one to one in there. Okay, so how can I use this? So, so when I first started doing this, I was using another uh, type of uh, living style guide. Was, uh, was a style guide that you would create, you would copy, and paste into your Drupal template and then go from there. So then after that, I started using other stuff and all that. I came across Emulsify, the guys from 4Kitchen. It's a freaking awesome system. So this is ready and uh, open source and you guys can download today. So when you go home or maybe outside, you guys can download this. This will be a Drupal theme. You throw inside the Drupal 8 theme folder, you run your NPM, your golf task, and then you will create the pattern lab, everything for you, and it works. So you guys can read the documentation, how to install, and you get it working. So this is awesome. So I start working with these guys for a kitchen and stuff. I downloaded there, and then I had this whole bunch of ideas and stuff. And I think some of you guys have heard about Mainspring. Aiden Foster, my good friend Aiden, that just had a baby on Tuesday, so he's not here. Uh, he created this main spring, which I've been using for the past two or three years, I think, with him. And I helped him collaborate it quite a bit. So I convinced him to move from hologram living style guide into uh, panel lab. 
out. So what we did is we forked Emulsify, got all the mainstream stuff into Emulsify, changed a bunch of stuff, and then became that. So for us, I was using that. Then Alex asked me to join their four. So when Homer and I, we got together, we had an idea to redo everything. It's not there. Oh, it's not there, right? No. Sorry, Just talk to it. Oh, okay. Just talk. Just talk. Okay. So we got to, 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 to build this, and then we built this thing uh, called Ergo. And uh, it's basically a system based on all this <coughs> that we are doing, but it's in-house sort of a thing. So I don't know what to go. Um, yeah, so we've taken, you know, we did some work with uh, Aiden and looked at some ways to improve it. And then we had our own take on it and started experimenting, experimenting with it. And as a proof of concept, um, we were able to use it on a recent project where we didn't get final designs and no real specifications until late in the game. And we had to have a way to be on our feet and modular and get this thing going to a sustainable point so that once we have the pieces we need to make sure we can complete on time, this was the route that we went using pattern mod. And from that, we took some learnings and the way that we approached it that we're now in the midst of working to make it better and stronger, so. Okay. Anything else you want to I'm not sure I lost the. Uh, we removed the page. Yeah, that was it. There was nothing else. The ergo page? What happened? There's nothing else. The ergo page. Okay. Okay, awesome. So, enough talk. Demo time. Let's hope I don't disappoint Business Cat here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, to help make things uh, hopefully smooth, I have um, Pattern Lab already running, and I'm gonna walk you through having a new component, a call to action, uh, similar to some of the ones we've seen, and show what it's like without styling, how Pattern Lab reacts when we start adding styling and updates in real time, and then getting into Drupal and how adding a paragraph can then tie into the component similar to how it was described here. So, uh, no, uh, business cat, you need to go. Okay. So, this here is an example of a little more complex call to action. Um, some of the things uh, around the methodology that started in Mainspring and we've inherited is the use of BEM classes and it's to help organize and reduce the amount of descriptions on any given item so that at any point in the clean DOM that we output you know exactly what div, what span belongs to what and to prevent collisions of styles because everything is so isolated that you're going to reduce any chance of overflow or you know, regressions, which are, you know, you get a bigger team, you work on a big project in different parts, that can crop up. And this helps to avoid that by just segmenting everything as much as possible. So in this example, um, this is an organism. It's going to have many parts to it, as you can see from the example here. And we have uh, a space for another component, which is an image. And although an image could be just an image line, there are some efficiencies to having an atom, one of the simplest components, with a couple options that we can pass along. Maybe we want it to be full width. Maybe we don't. We want to apply a different effect. It gives us the flexibility to still have simple tags without much effort of managing them from component to component. Um, as well, we have a section to show some icons along with the image. And then for the, the standard kind of uh, call to action part, to have a lead in, some body text, a button. And then the testimonial component that Pierre was uh, showing you before, a way to include that and output the, the component. So with the data model, 
similar to the testimonial for the call to action, we have some configuration and passing along additional data. And the whole point of the data modeling while we're working on the components is we know this is going to be in Drupal. So as much as possible, we're thinking, how is this going to work in Drupal? How can we make sure that the fields and all of the paragraphs or content fields, how do I get that to this and make sense and you know, not just be a mess? So we spend a lot of time on this and making sure that what we're doing with the component is going to be able to tie into Drupal. Um, so uh, let's see now. Get up Pattern Lab. Oh, did I let Business Cat down? No, oh, there we go. Okay. So here's an example of that component with the configuration in place. And as you can see, it's not styled, but it gives us the DOM, outputs it, gives us a chance to see right away you know, what we're working with. And then we choose to go and update the styling. Bring over my styles for the testimonial. And bring over my styles for the call to action. And with this in place, uh, without a typo, saving, Pattern Lab is going to inject and load the CSS without even a page refresh. Okay. So some of the supporting tools under Pattern Lab and the Drupal Pattern Lab specifically is Browser Sync. And how many of you have used or know of Browser Sync? Okay, so it's super efficient tool, lets you run multiple devices with one preview at a time and go up and down. But for efficiencies of building, inject CSS real time so you can tweak away and get things just right without having to do anything special. And some of the other bonus features are easily allow you to test responsiveness and you have a fun a little disco mode. <laughs> I don't know where they use that, but it's a good uh, test for your page. Will that survive <laughs> a crazy user resizing? Yeah. Yes, it will. Exactly. So it's a monkey test, and it's very handy to just catch those. You watch it, and oh, there's that one resolution. Let's find out where that is and start tweaking with it. All right. So now we'll jump into Drupal. And in Drupal, we've set up a call to action paragraph. So to satisfy the data model and the things that I'm expecting this reusable component to work with, in the paragraph, I have a lead in for the title, the body, a button, uh, the icon group, and image, and then as well as the testimonial fields. Usually, now, yeah. Usually we build this separate way. So because the component is a component, so it comes from a testimonial comes from a paragraph by itself. But we merge this together yeah. uh, in order for the demo. Yeah. So we could have this as one of those entity reference fields and be pulling a testimonial paragraph just as easily. Uh, you have that flexibility and you know, there's a level where you have to start saying enough is enough, so there is some considerations on how deep you want to go. Um, but for the sake of the demo, to show everything here, we have everything, you know, straightforward on the the one paragraph type. And then, you know, as well when we're building these, the reason why we start using paragraphs instead of just having one big content type that starts getting bigger and bigger is using it from different content types that may or may not need it but being logical in how we break out the individual fields and giving them some logical breakdown that we're not just throwing every field you know, to the client at all times. So they have a chance to go and work through the different content types um, as they're building things out. All right, so I'm... So for the sake of the demo, I have a simple content type with a paragraph injected. And this is what Drupal is going to give me when I haven't done anything. So I have the paragraph set up, I have all the fields coming to the Drupal template, but 
you know, Drupal is just going to put it out. It, you know, until you put styling or decide how you want to affect the template, you're just going to get what it gives you. So from there is where we have a chance to pull in the component similar to what Pierre displayed. So like the testimonial example, this gives us a chance to set up all of the mappings from Drupal into Pattern Lab. And anyone familiar with JSON, which I'm going to imagine a good chunk of you are, it's a very easy way to look at the data and make sure that this field is being this field sent along. Um, and some of the fields in this case, we're not always sending the field value. Uh, an example is this icon field that we're actually, in this case, passing an array. And that's a, another component or another view. And we can wrap a component around that if we want. For the sake of the demo, I just let Drupal put its diviitis through. But in this case, it's not a single field. It's an array of entities. And we can work with them or let Drupal do its thing. You have complete flexibility over how you want to manage the final output. And with all of this data is being sent across to the organism that we worked on. And now if we take a look, and if everything refreshed, There we go. Yay. It worked. So with that, this is now in Drupal, pulling the component in, and all the benefits and what we've built out in the components are now reusable anywhere across the site. All right. Now, <laughs> as I mentioned, you know, having a paragraph inside a paragraph just because you want to use different components it can get overwhelming and you have to really think about, okay, am I just creating too many components now and am I overdoing it or too many components in components and even making a component and you wanna say, oh, well, I wanna have two different styles and it's gonna be this style, this style. Well, do I just keep monstering one twig file now for a component and it becomes unmanageable? So there's a lot of thought that has to go into, you know, the structure of all of this and still remember, you're going back to Drupal. You know, For our sakes, we're tying as closely as possible in the Drupal. So it's really fine tuning you know, how deep we go with everything. All right, and that's the end of our presentation. If you have any questions, feel free. We're happy to answer them. Questions, anyone? Everyone's too scared. Or <laughs> Mike. How are you um, exploring the Arabic configuration for the technology that you use? Yes. So as, in, as you guys know, in Drupal 8, we have a configuration files, right? Well, we call the config files. So every time a entity or anything that's changed in Drupal that is not content, it creates this file, right? So we are just starting to tap into it. Uh, config files, is, it, it's very powerful, but it's very complicated to manage. So we are approaching it two ways. Do you guys remember features module from Drupal 7? It got rewritten in Drupal 8, and it exports the config file, creates a .info and .module file, and then you can install the module, and it will create your config and everything. It works for most of it, but I don't like because it's one more module that's going to be installed and I don't like to install a module if I don't have to, even if it's for that. So one approach that we are exploring and everything is to identify the config files that are being changed and then wrapping up with our components. So. Reusability-wise, what we would do is we have our testimonial component. Our testimonial component will have uh, the static file CSS and all that stuff that I showed, and then we have a folder with uh, config files. Then we can manually drop that into the Drupal config files big file, and then just run draft CIM, and then uh, it will create everything. We also exploring a automated way. Because what we are doing is, we, the idea of the component is to create a repo 
of components. And that repo also would have our config files and then we would create a script that would install our components in our config files from our uh, GitHub account or whatever you're doing. So that's the idea. Do you know an easy way to identify the right config files? Uh, there are many ways. So one way, uh, if you're going to do manually, the best is keeping your code into Git and then as soon as to get started with. I think that would be, that's how I did it myself. Uh, I have all my config files, everything in Git. I do drash CEX, which is export. As soon as export, Git will tell you what has changed. And that is the best way because you will see new files being created. So for each field, there will be a file. But if that field is being injected into a content type, there will be a change into the content type itself. Uh, and then if there is a change to the default display, not default, sorry, the display, there will be change on the system global file. So what I would recommend is to do that. Track and get, and then it will tell you exactly, and then as you start working more on that, uh, you will feel more comfortable and you understand what's being changed. Uh, but also just to do a search on Drupal.org for config files managing. And you will see a lot of smart people are trying many different things in them. It's pretty cool. Yes, uh, just to mention, uh, when you do address CX, you can also do a dash dash add, and it'll automatically add it to your uh, to your uh, get like uh, as in like your uh, like it won't add to your commit, but it'll add to your the track files. To your track files, right? Yeah. So like you'll confirm it, and it'll automatically just add it right there. So and you don't right. have to add that extra step. Just goes out. But you okay. can still see it all, of Okay, so get, uh, so, so drash is CEX, dash, dash, dash add. add. So there you go, thank you. So, any other questions? Come oh, on, you guys have questions. <laughs> yes. Do you manage the situation when uh, you basically deleting your node, where it has been very paragraphs, and then you put into the database, and the paragraph entities are still there? So there is like a couple of issues, some people break down when you have a paragraph you want to delete, and if you have quite a few, like a site, right? There's many nodes, it's basically flooding the database, it's unpleasant. That's right, yeah. I came across that problem uh, many times. It's sort of a weird, like in the leak, and it's this ghost data in there, right? Uh, early days of a Drupal, I caught quite a bit. We've been doing some stuff, and with the latest one, we are 8. Point what? 3. 4? Something like that? 3. 7. 3. 7. So I think the 3. 6 and 3. 7, I had to do that, and I didn't get that problem. So I think it uh, uh, has been fixed or something has changed. Also, Paragraph had a release, a new release. So I think it was an issue with Paragraph. And uh, it, I think has been fixed, but yeah, I, I've seen this this problem with the ghost data, which got me nuts. So <laughs> lucky we identified that pretty quick on our local computer, and then we were able to go after delete the data first, and then delete the paragraph. So yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So there's one more benefit to an approach like components of Pattern Lab, specifically using Twig in this case, is. If for some reason we need to do a standalone app using Node.js, there's interpreters to pick up the twig so that we can start injecting our components into a standalone app away from the Drupal website we're building potentially. So that all of the components we're building for the website are immediately transferable and able to render through JSON data on a Node.js app. So it gives you some flexibility in, yes, we're still aiming to build and tie this into Drupal, but we're not locked into only having to render this in Drupal. Yes. So there's a lot of flexibility with this kind of approach that we didn't have when you build a regular Drupal theme. Yes? yes. Um, you mentioned um, Emulsify and then you mentioned Mainspring as examples you took and then you designed something similar internally. It's are, are you exposing that somewhere? Or? Yeah, we do plan to at some point, but it's just a different methodology of the same tools. Like we are not, you know, again, reinventing the wheel because we are leveraging the work that they've already provided. 
and we're just trying to get an angle of what works best that we could then distribute and be meaningful because you know, to get it to up to snuff, there's a lot of work to make sure we have all the documentation, it's clear and concise, and that is supported enough for the community. So, yeah. so the most of file and the main screen, so the difference between the two is going to be this. So when uh, uh, I first start migrating, uh, forking Emulsify and then migrating Mainspring into it. So Mainspring was built by Aiden, Aiden Foster, and uh, uses DAM and SMAC folder structure and main convention, which is the same one you saw. We do M for molecule, dash component, underscore, underscore, because it's a it's the the next level down, and then there is a uh, 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 alteration in the kind of stuff. So the difference between emulsify and mainspring is going to be that. So if you download mainspring and you download emulsify, you will see the folder structure and the name convention is different. But just because we decide to do that. Uh, another thing is uh, emulsify is using a lot of what is what NPM stuff. We're using a lot of NPM stuff, and uh, uh, Mainspring use a lot of golf. Use a lot of golf. So that's the difference. And with the, our tool, basically, what we decide to do is to change not only the front end, but we are doing bigger stuff for back end as well. So we are doing a whole bigger thing and working more on uh, naming convention uh, because once you go deeper into componentization you got to really think about, like Homer said, be careful how you're naming things, how you're doing your components. Also, follow the structure of uh, variables and names and all that stuff. So, mm -hmm. any more questions? The one thing I wanted to add on that, so we have a pretty strong relationship with uh, both four kitchens and also with Aiden Foster. So, it's not a case where we just put their code and just started using the time to the table. There's uh, this quite strong feedback loop between them and us. So a lot of the work that Homer can do on the JavaScript side, feedback into their system, and some they merge back in, some they you know, get it, something that's specific on our side. But that's uh, that's kind of the ecosystem. It's working out to the point of Yeah. And we're at a stage where we can release it, like where we feel like it's something that yeah, Aiden has been a big help, and again, we also reciprocated in assisting them to get mainstream farther along. So, yeah. uh, you had a question, Levine? I have a question. So, every time we have to do the this seems to lend itself very well to the problem of what we have in the Do you have any questions or any kind of what did that say the question again? Sorry. Yeah. Like with this, everything is Yeah. Again, this is why this slide is here. Like you have to strategically look at how I can use things in a reusable way without just you know yeah. exploding the site and having you know the same problem, right? So it's very tactical. And you have to play around with it, and screw up, and fix it, and you know find the balance. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, what we've been finding is this: the more reusable we are trying to make, we are getting a little bit more bits wrapping around. But if you go back, really, the problem with the DVI items was that just div, 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 field name, field underscore, and field of field. So was divs just in there because the idea of a Drupal was, well, if a designer wanted to wrap something in here, they have an extra bit, right? So that was the idea. So with this system, you're doing more conscious. Even if you're getting that tree down, there is a reason why, and also there is a naming convention that you can start going, because we are using them, right? So you can start going up and really see what's going on. It's also kind of like the, yeah, the you know, it's sort of actually business value oriented, where it's, it's focused on the data model, it's focused on the structure of content, That's right. versus focused on mere Drupalism. That's so right. you know, the example you showed, it was like panel, bottle, like panel, panel, panels, panel, 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 panel. panel. That's right. Yeah. That's meaningless to the actual business value, it's just a Drupal. That's correct. As well as the excess of class usage, you know, like Bootstrap, 
theme and that sort of thing where there's just class, 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 and you're like, what the hell is this div doing? Like you, you have no way to isolate and know, I know exactly what this should be doing, and if it's not doing something, I can easily target and adjust. So that's another aspect that the BEM smacks definitely help with. So. Mm -hmm. so yeah, it's super new. It's, uh, we are figuring out as we go. So you guys, any questions? Any, <laughs> any questions? <laughs> I love that. Uh, <laughs> Sometimes I put it on my back screen and just keep watching. Uh, <laughs> 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 ah, come on, who doesn't like that? So, so yeah, so if you guys want to try, so I am part of a lot of places and people that are doing that. So like I said, the most of they're doing a lot of stuff, so I'm helping them out. Uh, Aiden, I'm part of Mainspring as well, helping them out. Uh, Paragraph. You know, join the paragraph uh, uh, issue queue and stuff. You will see there's some really cool stuff coming down the road in there that is just going to be amazing. Paragraph is just starting. If we get together as back develop, back end developer and stuff, all that as well, it's going to be even better. If you go look at the roadmap, it's going to be freaking awesome. Uh, Drupal Panel Lab. I will put the link in after uh, our presentation and stuff, but there is some huge stuff going on too. So we basically forked uh, Drupal, Pattern Lab Drupal from Pattern Lab repo into another repo, and the guys from Mosify are taking care of that, and we have fixed a bunch of stuff as well in there, and the roadmap is huge, and we are planning a lot, a lot of big things in there. So yeah. there is a community going, and, and the definitely <laughs> will get better. Uh, an idea of one of the issues they're trying to tackle is how we had the intermediary JSON like Drupal to Pattern Lab. They're looking at a way of maybe solving that and going straight to Pattern Lab. That's right. Whereas so like preprocessors, we set up you know that structure there maybe, and it's consistent config based potentially, and you skip that extra step of having to then link mm -hmm. one to one. So Map one to one, and that would be awesome because now we can create our class our our classes, our variables into a twig, and then just a magic matches to, to Drupal. Uh, the cool thing is this, let me just give you the last one in here. So I was working for a company, and uh, we were redesigning a, a Drupal site, and then they totally fired the whole digital team, got a new digital team, and they decided that they weren't going to do in Drupal anymore. They were going to build in October, uh, which is Laravel, so CMS sort of a thing. A lot of design was done, a lot of stuff was done, it was already created for uh, Drupal. So they saw how huge this thing was going to be and stuff, so they decided and I told uh, us, I ended up leaving, but uh, what they started doing is start building the whole thing into Panel Lab, Twig file, and the guys from October said, just give me the Twig files and then we will be fine. So now, building with Drupal in mind, and then ended up going to a October thing. Sounds good. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, guys.